and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Taylor Rockwell once again, and once again, I am alone in studio. Daryl remains in Michigan. With him out of town, I called up Steph Yang of Stars and Stripes FC, of The Athletic, of Two Drunk Fans podcast fame. Many, many different endeavors for Steph. Uh, We discussed the U.S. Women's National Team. They recently completed a successful run at the Tournament of Nations, defeating Brazil in the final. Uh, We look at what's to come for the team in terms of World Cup qualifying, in terms of the World Cup as a whole, but also the kind of inner working dynamics of the team, the situation with Jill Ellis, her popularity or lack thereof within the team, and maybe their kind of relationship with U.S. soccer as a whole. Lots and lots of stuff to discuss. Steph covers it all, makes it all accessible. She is very, very informed. I am slightly informed, much more so now, thanks to her. So with all that said, here's my conversation with Steph Yang. Joining me on the line, I've got Steph Yang. Steph, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Hi, Taylor. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk women's national team because it has been a while since we did that. I think Daryl and I sadly kind of follow the uh, the standard route, I guess, of like World Cup, Olympics, then we trail off a little bit. We cover some tournaments here and there, but mostly it's World Cup and Olympics for us. So we're trying to break that rhythm a little bit here by talking to you in August. Well, I always have opinions on the women's national team. Well, that's good. That's that's why I wanted to have you on because uh, the U.S. just wrapped up uh, the Tournament of Nations with like, uh, do they get a gold medal for winning that, or do they, do they just get a trophy? I think they got a trophy, but it's better than some of the other trophies that have been concocted for these types of tournaments. Wait, wait is is there one that stands out as being particularly not great? Is how I put that. So the original She Believes trophy looks kind of like a cross between a tuning fork and uh, the the paddles they use at the OBGYN for exams. Oh, that's lovely. It wasn't good. So. <laughs> no, okay. So hopefully the Tournament of Nations uh, trophy was a little different. But first off, I wanted to ask you a bit about, and like take as long as you want with explaining this one. Can you talk a little bit about how the U.S. Uh, team has evolved from, say, uh, 2015 and maybe even more recently, the the Rio Olympics to this point. You wrote a great ab- uh, article about it for The Athletic, so I kind of wanted to pick your brain about the evolution of this team. I think there are two tracks happening here. One is uh, coaching Jill Ellis primarily has realized that something had to change with the setup of the team. And then on the other track is it's simply a matter of the individual talent that is now available to the team. We've, I think, fully kind of emerged from the last era of women's soccer. So I'm talking about the very last of the 99ers. That's Abby Wambach. Um, uh, that that era, she wasn't a 99er, but like you know, kind of influenced by that era. But the very last of that, where it was, I would say Abby Wambach is supremely talented, but she's definitely still out of that last generation where it was at least 50 50, you know, uh, fast athletic in order to make up for maybe a last of, a lack of technicality. Um, and then we've moved out of that era now, I think almost completely fully, especially when you consider the depth of midfield talent available. Yeah. So I think those are those are two tracks that are converging nicely for twenty nineteen and that's how we've kind of transitioned into the next era. It's maybe women's soccer or women's national team three point oh ish, something like that. And how big of a like how big of a role do you think that loss to Sweden in the quarterfinals of the Olympics uh, played? Like, do you think that sort of facilitated this move towards maybe younger players with more technical skill, or do you think that that was something that was kind of always in the pipeline? I think it is a little bit of a coincidence, just by the matter of you know how people were aging and how old they were turning. Abby Wambach was already on her last legs mm-hmm. in 2015. In my personal opinion, she probably shouldn't have been on the roster, but you know obviously they found reasons for needing her there that were not necessarily apparent on the pitch. So you know I'm not in the locker room. I'm not going to second guess that. Um, I think that, yeah, it was a matter of people were getting older Mm -hmm. and they were going to have to replace them at some point anyway, uh, because U.S. soccer in general is, you know, with its national teams, they're very fond of momentum and it's hard to institute like actual real systematic change there. I think anybody who really follows U.S. soccer kind of would agree with that. Um, So between... 
you know, an older, an aging generation. And yeah, the the Olympics was a little bit of a shock, maybe not as much of a shock if they had gone out early in a World Cup, but still, uh, yeah, a shock because they were facing a team that they very much should have been able to break down. Mm -hmm. Like it should not have been that hard to deal with Sweden set up in a low block. So yeah, it was a little bit of A, a little bit of B. So do you think then, like, is that coupled with, say, like the U-20s recent loss or failure to advance, I should say, from the group stage of the U-20 World Cup? Like, is it a case that other countries are starting to catch up? Like, have we reached the point where we've gone from, say, like the dream team teams, like if you're going the basketball analogy of like just destroying everybody to suddenly everybody in the world starts to play basketball a little bit more, maybe teams start to catch up. Is that where we are now? Or oh, do they've you think caught up. Okay. They've caught up. There's All no right. start to. They have caught up. They're here. So who do you think is is then like like I know like like France has been a consistent problem for the U.S. Japan obviously causing problems at the U20s. Are those the two big ones, or are there other teams that you think uh, U.S. fans should be keeping eye, an eye on if they get drawn into the U.S.'s group? Well, in women's soccer, I think among the top ten teams, anyone can beat anybody. On it just depends on the day. Usually, I mean, yeah, you can talk about probabilities, but you just never know. Mm -hmm. I'd say top problem makers for the United States right now are France, Germany, and Australia. So Australia is the one that, that surprises me. And I know you wrote a little bit about uh, Australia and how they've kind of developed. It, it's, uh, I think you said the seeds of their youth development are starting to blossom. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah. These are seeds that, ironically enough, Tom Sermani kind of helped plant back in the day. Um, I want to say maybe eight or nine years ago when he was in charge of Australia. And then Tom obviously moved to the United States and famously got, or rather infamously got fired after a player coup. Ah, not, not ideal. No, in 2014 after we, um, he was trying to do something different. He was experimenting and the players kind of didn't like it. And we had a bad result at the Algarve in 2017. The Algarve is kind of a nothing tournament it doesn't really indicate anything and but it was enough for them to gain leverage with u.s soccer to say they wanted him to go he was gone and now we're seeing the experiment that he was running with australia turning them into a definite contender to be one of the top five if not one of the top three teams in the world and i don't i don't mean to put you on the spot so if if, if you don't know totally fine but um do you know like what that like meant like what did they have to do in australia because i know uh the men's teams very much struggling in australia it sounds like the women's teams not having those issues so have they gone about it differently or have it, has it just been a matter of kind of really getting grassroots uh getting better at identifying player talent uh it was an identification of player ta talent and in like putting a pipeline into place mm -hmm. to successfully transition these kids from youth to national team. So at the youth level, um, giving them quality, technical, tactical training, and then impressing upon them what was necessary in order to compete on the international level and getting them started early. They started capping kids age 15, 16, 17, and then just letting them learn, not you know, it, the United States has started doing this a little bit, but what Jill Ellis is doing is she's letting these kids kind of nibble at the edges, see what's going on, but then not testing them in any meaningful way. With Australia, they were willing to, you know, field a bunch of 16, 17 year old kids on the field and lose horribly if they were going to learn from it. And ha is, is Jill Ellis kind of still sticking with that model, in your opinion? Is she not maybe giving young players the experience or is she starting to kind of get some new blood in there. It seems like Tierna Davidson would be an example of a youngster who's uh, getting minutes, getting opportunities. I think it depends on the position. Mm -hmm. She's been willing to give younger players minutes, yeah, a little bit in that defense because it's kind of sad to think, but we all know Becky Sauerbrunn can't play forever. Um, I like to think that she can, but if you want to put it that way, fine. She'll go to a place where other center backs can run around all day long in the open, like a nice farm mm. for them. So <laughs> please don't worry. <laughs> I, I like so, that. Okay, that makes me feel better. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we can't go visit her, but I just want you to know she'll be very happy at the center back farm. Oh, that's good. That's that's perfect. Yeah. The center back farm sounds sounds so happy and ominous all at once. So and then the, and she's been willing to give some kids a shot in midfield. Um, and and then you know obviously bringing in players like Mal Pugh at Ford, mm. although I think Mal Pugh is a little bit of an outlier because yeah. she's such an extraordinary talent. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, she's been doing it a little bit, but I really don't think she's been doing it to the extent that we needed while we could. And now I think it's a little bit too late because we're looking at World Cup qualifying in October. So it's going to have to wait until after next summer, really, for or maybe even after 2020 because the importance of the Olympics for 
you know, U.S. soccer to maybe start looking at that strategy of getting these kids in young and then being willing to, you know, let them falter or to let the team lose in order to learn from that. All right. Well, so they've just won the Tournament of Nations, uh, beating Brazil 4-1 to in the final. You said they've got World Cup qualifying coming up. What are some things that, like, heartened you coming out of this tournament that made you think, like, okay, things are better than they've ever been or things are very good? And are there things in there that maybe gives you give you cause for concern? So I'll say the top thing that I really enjoyed out of Tournament of Nations was seeing the quality of our midfield. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily put together – in the best way, they they definitely had problems with you know possession, with um, kind of finding each other and moving in the in the formation efficiently. But you know there's great individual quality in the pool, and if they can kind of figure each other out between Lindsey Horan, um, Rose Lavelle, definitely Julie Ertz, players like that, even McCall Zerboni, you know she's older, but if she can play, then she can play, and she can hang with the team right now. It seems. So I think the quality there is any of these players would crack the starting lineup of any other nation's team easily, I think. I mean, I, I, that checks out for me. Do you think that the three you just listed, Haran, Ertz, and Lavelle, I know they started against Brazil. Do you think that is likely to be the midfield three if the U.S. sticks with a 4-3-3? I really couldn't say at this point because Because there's about 700 tournament- options? There's about 700 options, and this Tournament of Nations, I think, was Jill Ellis also experimenting with her 4-3-3. She seems to be wanting to use these little micro-tournaments to simulate the group stage of a tournament, which I think is just smart. And then she she's also using them to test like a particular formation and style of play repeatedly against several different teams, which, once again, is kind of how you want to run an experiment. I know I've bagged on Jill Ellis a lot before, but I kind of liked seeing the same setup over and over, but within the same tournament, they don't matter. They don't. They really don't matter in the big scheme of things. They're just high level friendlies. So why not test out your formation against three very different mm-hmm. opponents to you know probe where the weaknesses are? I will say on the flip side, you asked you know some of the things I didn't like. Mm-hmm. I really don't like how she's handling our goalkeeping situation. Um, yes, I see the value in getting a consistent number one, but I just said that this tournament doesn't matter, mm-hmm. and I really don't think it's going to damage Alyssa Nair's progress at number one now for the national team uh, to see another younger keeper in there. It doesn't even have to be Jane Campbell. They called in Adriana French. I think French, if you look at her play in NWSL, she's made an extremely strong case for herself to be competing at least for the number two position. Like, if Jill Ellis is telling the truth when she says, I make decisions based only on soccer, then I don't see how you can leave French out of the conversation. But maybe she thinks it's too late. So so is it then that just the case that, like, like Nair is the kind of established number one, you don't want to rock the boat a little bit? But it, I guess then that kind of leaves you open to if Nair can't go or maybe make some mistakes, which it sounds like maybe she makes some questionable decision making at times. Uh, then it leaves you basically with a lot of inexperienced options. Is that, like, roughly the case? Yeah, exactly. And that's the old cycle that we went through with Hope Solo when Alyssa Nair and Ashlyn Harris's were kind of the two and three underneath her. Um, it was papered over a little bit because in the Hope Solo era, we also had Nicole Barnhart, who was in you know the same age group as Hope and was a, an extremely dependable number two keeper. Maybe she wasn't as uh, quite as good a goalkeeper as Hope Solo. I don't think that's really an insult to say you're not as good as Hope Solo. Mm-hmm. Um Nicole Barnhart is even still playing in NWSL and still playing very solidly. She's such a reassuring presence in goal. I think for a long time, you know, there was kind of a false sense of security among the U.S. soccer coaching staff. And then the moment, you know, hope is gone, Nicole Barnhart can't compete on the international level anymore. It's like, oh, shoot, we didn't, you know, do our due diligence in developing the goalkeeper pool. And it's happening again. That seems like a, a pretty common uh, approach across U.S. soccer, because I would say the men's team kind of suffering through that right now as well. Uh, the, men, the men's team also suffering with uh, coaching problems. I wanted to go back to something you said earlier. Uh, you said you'd bagged on uh, Jill Ellis in the past. Was that for any particular reason or a variety of reasons? I mean, a variety of reasons for using tactical setups that weren't working very well and not being able to adjust the game against Sweden in the Olympics. Mm. Um, Also for a reluctance to rotate players, maybe being a little bit too beholden to veterans, um, 
you know, that sort of thing. Just tactical setups that didn't seem to optimize the players that she had. So I do give her credit for being willing to experiment, but at the same time, I, I just feel sometimes like she lucks into good setups a little bit. Hmm. Maybe that's, you know, it's a little bit mean, but it's is what I feel. So is that then, like, do, when you say that, do you mean that, like, she's got the depth of talent that she can sort of throw some stuff out there and maybe adjust it a little bit and the players are good enough to kind of figure it out and make it work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, so with that in mind, then, it does sound like, so you mentioned that there's, like, what, at least five midfielders who could play, if not many, many more. I think I threw out 700. Uh, it does feel like there are so many attacking options with this squad that, it almost feels inevitable that a big name is going to be left out. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but like I know Carly Lloyd is maybe in a position where she's not going to be starting anymore. It seems like she'll probably still be in consideration for the qualifiers and the World Cup uh, as well. But do you think there is a chance that somebody gets left on the sidelines or I guess gets left at home? Well, it maybe depends on what you consider a big name because, you know, we talked earlier about how we're transitioning out of the old era with the veterans and there's all these kind of new kids. I don't think they're kids anymore, but it feels like they're kids to me anyway. Kind of these new players starting to establish themselves and they're building their own legacies. So I would say the big names like on the roster right now would be maybe Tobin Heath, Megan Rapino, Carly Lloyd, Becky Sauerbrunn, Alex Morgan. And I don't see any one of them being in serious danger of of not being on the roster. Mm. I would say Amy Rodriguez, she's a little bit of a veteran slash legacy player. Um, and she's being given a shot here because, you know, she was recovering from ACL mm. and she had another child. And uh, it's I think it might be a partially a respect thing to see how she's doing in the pool, but also it might be contractual and that if you are out for a certain reason, you're guaranteed a certain number of call-ups so that they can reevaluate you after like an injury or something uh, or pregnancy. So that I might be that. part of what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's actually a really cool policy. Like if you're out for a certain, I think pregnancy, then you're guaranteed a call-up afterwards so that they'll reevaluate you because it ensures that nobody essentially gets kicked off the team for having a family. So actually, if you don't mind, I wanted to go into a little bit more about like some of the kind of nuances of the policies behind U.S. women's soccer, uh, because with like the the men's side, it's not quite as big of a deal if a player who's been in there for, you know, like a run of six friendlies or a Gold Cup or something gets left off to try other names. It, is it the case then that with the women's team, it's it's far more detrimental both to their like careers and their income if they do get dropped? Like how big of a step is that if a player suddenly stops getting called up when she had been getting regularly called up? Well, hopefully all of your listeners know the difference in contract structure between the men's and the women's team and the historical reasons why. But very quickly, obviously men have a much stronger club game. You can make a living playing club, whereas for women, NWSL, the top tier of pro women's soccer in this league, the most you can make if you're not a national team member is probably around the 44,000 range a year. And then the minimum is like a 15 something thousand right now. And that's progress after the first year when the minimum was, I think, closer to 7,000. So you, you can kind of live year to year as a pro right now, but it's, you know, it's tough. So a women's national team contract is really the only way to make a viable, good living playing women's soccer right now in this country. That's just, you know, kind of the crappy way that history has set things up for, for women's soccer in this country. Um, it's extremely important to be in that pool, to be contracted, to be allocated in financial terms anyway. If you do well for the national team and it's a World Cup year and you win and you get all your bonuses, top players are probably looking at, you know, close to $300,000. That, that's slightly better than 17000 or 15000 Yeah. I realize compared to club salaries, 300000 still sounds terrible, but you can live pretty well off of yeah. $300,000. I would happily take $300,000. Right yeah, now. exactly. Yeah, that would change me. a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Um, and if you're kind of at the bottom of the contract uh, structure, uh, you're still probably going to make a good six figures. Mm -hmm. So, and and forgive me, because I actually, I don't know. W what is the like qualification to be in the pool? Is it one call up? Is it five call ups? Like, what gets you there? Uh, they changed things up with the most recent CBA negotiations. 
Um, it used to be they had these things called floaters, which were people who get called into camp for a certain number of camps without having to be signed to a contract. And they would get paid, you know, a lesser fee. And then they would, I think, get paid based on if they made a roster and stuff like that, just like here and there. And those people were like four figure players. Uh, I think this new CBA, they expanded the number of players who could be called floaters. I don't think they like the term floaters. Um, yeah, I imagine not non-contract players maybe who can drift in and out before you have to be on contract which enables Jaws to expand her player pool naturally right because if Mm -hmm. she's bound by her budget which kind of sucks that naturally limits how many people that she can bring in and out uh so then do you so then do you think like are there players that will still continue to get call-ups like not saying this is the case with amy rodriguez but then are there players who will continue to get those call-ups so that they stay within that pool or is that not necessarily a consideration i don't think that's necessarily a consideration um i think once again we're moving away from an era where you maybe defer too much to an older player out of respect for the legacy that they brought to the program i think we're moving into a newer era where it's a little bit more performance based and there's less hand wringing about cutting a veteran name from the roster. I would hope Uh, we might see that play out in microcosm with Carly Lloyd, but I don't know. Uh, But the, my understanding right now of contracts is that yes, it's pretty important to be on a contract, but it's becoming slightly less important and it may become even less important with the next contract negotiation, but that's several years in the future. More from the incredibly insightful Steph Yang in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about today's sponsor, Liverpool Jeans. Liverpool Jeans are premium quality jeans at non-premium prices. That is something I am very appreciative of. Uh, and I was also very appreciative of Liverpool Jeans on tour. I think as Daryl and I said previously, uh, we wore them. We had to like you know make sure we weren't like matchy-matchy and wearing the same pair. But we wore Liverpool Jeans pretty much every day of the tour uh, because they are comfortable. They stretch when you need them to. Long car rides on the road. They're good for that. Uh, Easy to take care of and very fashionable with a great fit. Can't say enough about Liverpool jeans, but I can say that if you need a pair, uh, we're holding a new jeans contest where basically we're asking you to send us a photo of you in your worst pair of jeans. We've had a few entries so far. We're going to keep the competition going for one more week. Then we will close it and pick a winner slash loser. I'm not sure. I guess a loser who's a winner because if you've got the worst jeans, you got the worst jeans, but it also means you get a new pair of jeans. Uh, so send your photo to, uh, Contact at totalsoccershow.com. You can title it Liverpool Jeans Contest. That's the pretty straightforward way to do it. Um, but if you don't want to enter that contest and you instead just want to get yourself a pair of jeans or a couple pairs, you can do that by going to liverpooljeans.com. And when you go to checkout, you can use the coupon code TSS to get 20% off your order. Once again, that's liverpooljeans.com and coupon code TSS for 20% off your order. And of course, if that's too much to remember, then of course there is the link in the show notes that you can use to get to their website. Thank you again to Liverpool Jeans for sponsoring today's episode of the Total Soccer Show. Now back to my conversation with Steph. One other like behind the scenes thing I then wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned that the US or in your article, you mentioned the US uh, has famously exacting fitness requirements. Um, Is that like I know American teams tend to be very fit for tournaments, but are there specific things they do? Are there specific requirements or regulations they have in terms of fitness to keep these teams as like high end as they possibly can? So the Americans have always been fit. It's how they came to the game and how they dominated it Mm -hmm. early. But when we talk about U.S. women's soccer and fitness, you only need to know one name, and that's Dawn Scott. She's their current, you know, head trainer, and she has brought. I think she really helped U.S. soccer on the women's side start looking at fitness scientifically, bringing in the sports science side of it, tracking everything possible, um, putting numbers on everything so that progress was quantifiable. Don Scott has really revolutionized the program and kind of like squeezed that last percentage of fitness out of players. So, you know, anybody can be fit, but I feel like she's done an incredible job with sports science, optimizing each person to be like the best possible human being they can be physically. I feel like shades of Rocky Four is what I'm hearing here, where it's like these specified like uh, regimens designed to make these players like like uh 
I don't even know what the term is, like more than human. Like they can just run for like hundreds of miles at a time. And I'm okay with yeah, that. I like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> like I must crush you. There we go. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for saying that very briefly in a way that I just had to ramble on for like 10 minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, and then going back to Jill Ellis as well then. So it seemed like she was maybe kind of on the hot seat heading into the World Cup in 2015, kind of stayed on the hot seat through the group stage, then wins the World Cup. That probably gets you some breathing room. After the Rio Olympics, though, what do you think her status is with U.S. soccer? Does she need to do very well in this tournament? Does she need to win the Women's World Cup to keep her job? Or does she even want to keep the job after this tournament? Well, the last we heard about Jill Ellis and her contract with U.S. Soccer, I think she's contracted through at least 2019. I'm not sure about the 2020 Olympics, but if they do well in 2019, I mean, it's probably almost a given that they'll go through 2020. And I don't know if you saw, I think it was a Sports Illustrated Insider uh, with Grant Wall, where he talked about there was another attempt at a player revolt with Jill Ellis. Like, they came for Tom Sermani, and then they tried it again with Jill Ellis, but this time, U.S. Soccer, I think Sunil Gulati was still president at the time, and then later on, Carlos Cordero. So that maybe gives you a general idea of the timeline of when they attempted this. Um, We're like, no, we're going to stick behind Jill. This is the coach we have, so you're just going to have to deal with it. (laughs) Wait, so that's recent. I I, I guess that that totally surprised me. No, I I missed that Grant Wall story. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what it was about or what the grievances were about? I think it was trying to oust the coach or to address issues that they had with the coach, Jill Ellis. Yeah. And Sunil Gulati was like, I back my coach here. Um, but, do, but do you think it was like style of play? Like they didn't want to continue to play this certain way. They wanted to play this way. Do you think it was about player selections or is it just kind of too difficult to know? I have no idea wow. here. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, it could have been about anything, really. Um, I think they kind of felt they saw what they got with Tom Sermani and maybe uh, certain louder voices in the locker room who were familiar with that situation thought, you know, it's it's time to try and shape things the way I want to shape them. And it didn't happen. And who are, like, not necessarily in terms of ousting Jill Ellis, but just generally speaking, who are the voices in the locker room now? Because, so like, in the past, it was Abby Wambach, as you mentioned, uh, and then, like, Hope Solo, obviously, uh, always going to be front and center when it comes to those types of conversations. Who do you think is in there now leading the locker room, organizing the locker room? Well, until recently, the co-captains were Carly Lloyd and Becky Sauerbrunn, which I thought was a nice balance both in terms of personalities on the pitch and off the pitch. If you're going to have two captains, you don't want two of the same type of personality. Um, recently, the uh, second armband has been going to Alex Morgan, and Jill Ellis has said it's because she wants to bring Morgan more into a leadership role. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think Alex Morgan has always kind of led on the field through her play, but I guess she also wants her to you know, be thinking more consciously about her leadership and and what it means. She is like an older veteran player now. It really seems like just yesterday, Alex Morgan was baby horse. She was this wunderkind that we carried the hopes of the entire program on her shoulders. And she does to a certain extent still carry the hopes of U.S. soccer. But now she's, you know, she's a veteran. She's got, I don't know how many caps. It's got to be close to a hundred by now. Um, But uh, yeah, she's 29 years old and, um, I guess now is the time before the World Cup. So I don't know how loud a uh, voice Alex Morgan is in the locker room, but Mm -hmm. that is the leadership situation. Uh, I'd say probably they might want to start looking at Lindsay Horan Mm -hmm. as well and maybe Abby Dahlkemper because that's an important part of your spine up the midfield. So even if they're not wearing the captain's armband, those two need to be able to take charge on the field and dictate what's going to happen. And and is there a chance, I'm guessing there wasn't, but uh, is there a chance that like some of the situation is how I'm going to phrase that involving, is it Jaylene Hinkle? Yeah. Do you think that like the decision to call her up again, maybe was part of the reason why some players weren't so thrilled with Jill Ellis? No, I think the timing on that is kind of separate from any kind of revolt against her. Um, I think it's a separate issue. And I think there was probably a mix of players who were like, if she helps us win, then I don't care. As long as she keeps her mouth shut, and you know, we can go our separate ways. And maybe there were some players who were a little more disgruntled. But, you know, there there is very much a culture at U.S. soccer of like, if you speak up, you might get into trouble. Like, no one is untouchable. 
you're all expendable. And if you make too much trouble, some players in, at U.S. Soccer right now are already on one strike after, you know, maybe kneeling for anthems. So who could even you possibly if, be referring to? Even if they felt, you know, personally, yeah. um, you know, affected by the decision, maybe they felt they couldn't say anything. That's just speculation on my part. Mm-hmm. But it's maybe how I would feel being an openly gay player in that situation. Yeah, I feel like I keep putting you on the spot with having to like discuss difficult things. <laughs> so I'll do my best here to explain this, and then you tell me if I'm way off base. But sure. from my understanding, the Jaylene Hinkle uh, situation was essentially that she went on 700 Club to mm-hmm. say that she like turned down a call up because she didn't want to wear the jersey with like the rainbow number. Uh, and I guess the idea was that it went against her beliefs. Um, I think she used a very strange term for explaining it. I can't remember what it was. Um, but it, it, and then essentially that, that kind of the fact that she was then caught up again after that, when you have openly gay players, uh, and a coach who's married to a woman with a kid, um, it, it feels like maybe that would have caused some concern within the locker room. Is that a fair summary of the events? Yeah. I think maybe you were. You're thinking about the strange word. It, was it obedient? She said, I felt like I was being obedient by doing this. Yeah, I think it was that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So th- so then when you say players are, like, are afraid to speak out, do you, do you feel like there was a hesitation from some of the players to come out and say, like, yeah, I don't want her on the team for fear that U.S. soccer would come after them? Or was it like the opposite? Was it players were afraid to come out one way or the other because they didn't want U.S. soccer to get frustrated with them for publicly espousing opinions? Well, I did do an article for The Athletic where I talked to a, a former player about the situation and – yeah, she speculated that maybe there were people there who were afraid to express an opinion specifically on this topic, but also because generally in the past, U.S. soccer has not reacted kindly to players mm-hmm. having thoughts that were a little too independent for the PR image of the team. Yeah, and that's oh, – man, that's really frustrating because it, I, I do feel like if you – as I said, like at the very beginning, I think Daryl and I tune, tune in for like the major tournaments and we, we go all in on the major tournaments. But I think sometimes with everything else that goes on in soccer, we maybe lose focus on the women's game. Um, and so when you tune back in, it can be very easy to just see like, oh, look at this harmonious group and they film funny Instagram videos together and look how happy they are. And I, and there comes a time when it does feel like, yeah, is that really them or is that what they're being asked to do so that you get this whole harmonious group vibe? heading into a major tournament when they know eyes will be on the team oh there's definitely been a big marketing push to present them as you know it's just one big happy Mm -hmm. family and i think that's partially because they are women people Mm -hmm. aren't really used to the idea of of women being a bunch of individuals who all might you know disagree from time to time um on a very deep fundamental level they want to believe oh it you know they're women they know how to get along they're socialized to be friendly blah 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 uh, and U.S. Soccer has found that a very powerful marketing tool in going, yeah, they're role models and they bring little girls together and stuff like that. And I think they've kind of gone too far in on that and they don't really see a way out for themselves. It's kind of like when they built uh, an entire campaign around Abby Wambach and chasing Mia and the goal record. And then in her last game, they lost, you know, stuff yeah. like that. They they were they were beholden to the superstar that they had made and it gave her a lot of power and so you know when it came time to need to extract themselves from having Abby around i think you know they realized that they had made a problem for themselves here and it's like she was basically able to dictate kind of the tempo of how she wanted everything to go in in my opinion that's how it seemed to me watching events unfold so yeah u.s soccer is very much about their marketing tools and if you step out of line in a way that damages their ability to market they don't like it wow all right well that's a good thing to keep in mind uh and i feel like i've taken us down a path so does that, <laughs> does that to to kind of bring it back to the team as a whole then and the world cup qualifying like so do you think then obviously winning a tournament winning it in style i would say in that final uh do you think that that alleviates some of the like maybe tension or maybe some of the issues in the locker room or do you think it's basically going to be a team heading into qualifying that is very talented but has some locker room issues some tension behind the scenes 
I think if there is tension behind the scenes by now, a lot of the players in this core group have been playing together long enough that it's just not going to matter. And the player who I talked to for The Athletic reminded me, like, when there's winning on the line, when there's a World Cup on the line, you'll put aside a lot of your own personal feelings because it's a World Cup. You get one shot at it every four years, and you have to be one of 23 players who are able to go. That's only 23 players out of the entire nation. So if you can imagine, like, the prestige and, like, the work that goes into that event, like, yeah, I think a lot of them would be willing to put aside a lot in order to make that happen. And then as soon as the trophies are handed out and you get on the bus, Mm -hmm. then you can pick a fight if you want, I guess. That's that's a good policy. Pick the fight after the trophy. That makes exactly. sense. And ideally, it's it's a better looking trophy than paddles. Much better okay. looking. All right. That's good. Um, well, well, a couple of final questions, and then I will let you go. I appreciate all, all of your time and all of your insight. It's genuinely fascinating. Um, are there names, uh, like in addition to the names we've kind of already seen uh, in this most recent roster and in rosters of the past, are there any new names that you think might be called in? Say, for example, Sophia Smith or Ashley Sanchez. Do we? Do you think we see any of them getting opportunities in qualifying or maybe in the run-up to the World Cup? I don't know. I mean, qualifying, if the United States does not qualify handily through this tournament based on our competition in CONCACAF, I think that would be an actual call for crisis in the women's program. That's how, um, I don't want to say easy, but how expected it is that we should qualify given the level of competition that we have. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. expected. Um, So so then do do you think that like sets the stage for some young players to come in or do you think it's more about you want to qualify uh, as expected so then maybe you don't test those youngsters? I mean, I would hope that Ellis would at least have some of the younger kids kind of nibbling around the edges of camp so they can see how the prep is done, what's going to be expected of them. And then when she names her actual roster, she'll go with the tried and true names because it is qualification. It doesn't matter how expected things are. You need to qualify first and experiment later. And then looking ahead to France, first off, are, are you planning to uh, to go to France or are you going to cover it remotely? The plan is to go to France and actually live there for a month. It's how I did it in Canada. But I think living in Vancouver when you're an American is a little bit different than living in Paris or Lyon. Yeah, but that that's the plan to go for a month and live there because it's it's a very nice way to cover a tournament. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Daryl, Daryl and I are like, I think we're leaning towards doing the same because we've never done that before. We've never covered a tournament kind of on the ground, moving from location to location. And it feels like it would be like a very interesting way to cover it, to do it if you're covering specifically the U.S. Because otherwise, if it makes it hard to do every single game. So I guess if we're just doing the U.S., maybe we will run into each other in uh, in France then, if that works for you. Yeah, probably. It's a small country, right? We probably... <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Paris isn't that big. <laughs> nah, I'd be fine. Um, and then in Paris, uh, are there like do, how how do I phrase this? Because I know I don't want to say like so. You think we're going to win again, right? But how likely do you think it is? Like, do you think the U.S. is in a strong position in relation to where they were at this time before the 2015 World Cup, or do you think that there are still enough question marks that it uh, it makes success at the World Cup uncertain? So I don't believe in the supernatural, but I'm going to phrase this in a way that reduces possibility of jinxes. <laughs> All right. I think the United States has as good a shot as any of the other top nations to win. Mm-hmm. But I think they're one of maybe four or five names out there that everyone should keep their eye on. Mm-hmm. All right. That's like well I said before, said. Yeah. Germany, France, Australia, United States, maybe. Uh, I actually wouldn't put Japan in that group just yet. All right. And in terms of like like the best players, the cream of the crop in the world, is it? Do you think it's the case that right now, like the like, do you think an American wins the Ballon d'Or next, like this coming year, or do you think there's a chance somebody else thinks it? I think there's as good a chance as any of an American <laughs> winning. Right. It, it's because it's the World Cup year. The mm-hmm. you know we recently had the the women's Euro, so that's definitely on top of everyone everyone's minds and influences voting and. Um, so, yeah, next year with more of a, a global tournament happening, yeah, if somebody just goes crazy at the tournament and drops a hat trick in the final in like 17 minutes, sure. That'll do it, I, I guess. Well, if that happens, you will be there, I'm guessing. Uh, but until then, uh, if people want to read more uh, from you or hear more from you, uh, how can they do so? Uh, I am covering the women's national team at Stars and Stripes FC on SBNation.com. 
Um, and I have a women's soccer podcast called Two Drunk Fans. <laughs> oh, quick question. How, uh, because iTunes can be sort of picky with that. How is it like spelled? Like if people want to search it, is it the number two? Is it TWO? Oh, it's the number two mm-hmm. drunk fans. Okay. Dot com. Beautiful. Um, we're not necessarily on iTunes, but we do have an RSS feed that you can use to add manually to your list of podcasts that you listen to through iTunes. Perfect. And then you're, you'll still be writing for The Athletic, I'm assuming. As well. And yes, I will still be writing for The Athletic. Excellent. All right. All the more reason to subscribe to The Athletic. But Steph, thank you so much for, for taking all that time. Uh, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate how, uh, how much you were able to help me better understand the women's national team because there was a lot I did not know. There's still a lot I don't know, but at least it's less now. No problem. Like I said, I always love talking or sharing my opinions anyway about the women's national team. All right. Well, hopefully we can make this like a semi-regular thing in the lead up to the World Cup and then make it a much more regular thing in the World Cup. Nice. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks again, Steph. And we will talk to you soon. All right. So thank you once again to Steph Yang for her insane amount of knowledge about the U.S. women's national team, as well as just U.S. soccer as a whole. Lots of insight there. I was slightly embarrassed when she was like, I'm sure your listeners know this. And I just thought to myself, I do not know this. So I'm glad we covered lots of uh, lots of bases. But now we've got more stuff to talk about. And to help me do that, we've got my old co-host, my current co-host, my friend and your friend, Daryl Grove. Hello, Daryl. Hello, how are you doing? I thought I'd been replaced for a second there. Yeah, you never know. Concerned. You never know. I mean, we, we've had we've had a couple guests on since since you uh, since you had to go to Michigan. So who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe there'll I'm, be some replacements. I'm jealous. You got to talk to Graham Hunter. I've always enjoyed his work and Steph Young as well. I've been wanting to talk to Steph Young about the uh, U.S. Women's National Team. So it seems like you're doing all the shows I wanted to do while I'm away. Yeah, in fact, I think I I am uh, sad to say I think the last time we talked to Steph Young was right around the 2015. I, I said this in the interview, 2015 World Cup, maybe the 2016 Olympics. But again, I think that's when you were out of town is when I called her up. Uh, <laughs> and yes, Graham Hunter, if Graham Hunter wants to come on the show, we will happily add him as a third uh, host. I'll, I'll right, make then. that declaration right now. Yeah. Uh, but yes, but you have joined me to do a little bit of scouting, but also to talk about today's sponsor, The Athletic. Yay, The Athletic. Mm-hmm. Um, as people will know, because we've been running ads for The Athletic for a while now, it's where all the best soccer writers are congregating. That's correct. I mean, uh, Graham Hunter, the aforementioned, and Steph Yang, as we said many times in the interview, both yeah. writing for The Athletic, as are folks like, say, Paul Tenorio, who uh, yeah. this morning, uh, we're recording this Thursday. Uh, this morning, he came out with the article about La Liga potentially having a game here in the United States. So is this, um, if I understand this correctly, this is a bit like Premier League game 39 thing that was floated many years ago and then yeah. sort of pushed away. It seems like the Liga have put their hands up and said, we'll do that. Let's do that. I, yeah, I can't tell, though, if it's a 39th game or if it's, it sounds like it will just be a, a regular season La Liga game, a fixture. Ah, uh, okay, that makes more sense. What I'm confused by is that the way it was announced, like the headlines I saw were potentially starting this season and they went from potentially starting to starting this season to this season there will be i don't think that's true uh from paul's article they signed uh what relevant sports uh who do the icc they signed a 15-year contract with la liga which aims to bring a spanish regular season game to the united states and it seems very specifically that location will be miami uh, that, I mean, that would make sense, obviously, mm-hmm. just for language reasons. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I read the story as well. It's worth noting, Paul Tenorio, proper journalist, right? So yes. probably this is the proper reporting from Paul Tenorio. Mm. And then all the other headlines you see that are um, La Liga definitely bringing a game to the US next season. Um, that's the sort of snowball clickbait journalism that has uh, sort of <laughs> attached itself to the proper Tenorio journalism. Yeah. I want to say, speaking of proper Tenorio journalism, I'm hoping that this wasn't just him ditching me, but like... At- at least two times when we were with him uh, in Atlanta for All Star, he was like, "Oh, it, like I gotta go do something. I gotta go talk to a source. I gotta go mm-hmm. talk to somebody." And it, and I feel like that is proper journalism that he's kind of always on call, always working, and not just like, "Okay, I'm done with this conversation." Yeah, but I have and the not, excuse of being a proper journalist, and not but not dropping us any breadcrumbs either, so we yeah. can't accidentally scoop him. Well, there's that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's a crafty one. That's an Oreo. Loose loose lips sink stories. <laughs> Well, not necessarily loose lips, but uh, Spanish Footballers Association lips uh, are not thrilled uh, with this decision. Uh, the quote I saw was, footballers are not currency that can be used in business to only benefit third parties. So it doesn't sound like they're too thrilled about the prospect of playing a league game in the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it happens, it's sort of the beginning of the end, right? For integrity of domestic leagues. That's my, that's my hot, hot take. 
Uh, why do you why do you say that? I don't because think I disagree, you, but why do you say that? Because once this happens, then you're a, you're like another mm. step towards maybe then a La Liga team actually being based in Miami, and we end up with this weird uh, global league where there are franchises of teams that are like La Liga Spanish teams, but based in other countries. There'll be like a, a La Liga team in the USA, one in China, and I, th- I think it's the first step to all that happening, all that unraveling. And you know, you know me, we've had these conversations a lot of times. I'm not. Um, a hardcore traditionalist, but I do like the idea of domestic league being domestic league. <laughs> I, like, I like the idea that you've had to back that as though that's some sort of like traditional old school opinion of like, I'm just saying that I think the Spanish league should probably play in Spain. <laughs> like, yeah. that's not, I don't know if that's that <laughs> controversial of an opinion. <laughs> but either way, uh, you can read Tenorio's article, lots of comments at the bottom. You can voice your own opinion. You can email us your opinion because I'm curious to hear what people think about this. But it's also worth noting there is lots and lots of other coverage at The Athletic. Uh, of course, you have to be a subscriber to gain access to that content. But if you wanted to you get, do that... You get the first two paragraphs for free, but I think that's uh, that's not as useful as the whole story. You. They lure you in. They, they lure do. you in. But if you wanted to subscribe, if our listeners wanted to subscribe, Daryl, what could they do? I mean, they could get 40% off. There we go. Full price. Get there we 40% go. 40% off. Go to theathletic.com slash TSS August. TSS August. And there's a clue in that URL as to how long the discount is going to last. Uh, indefinitely? <laughs> yeah. If August lasts indefinitely, then yes. That's what I think indefinitely means. Lasting until the end <laughs> of August. It's a, it's a, it's a weird usage. Uh, Daryl, while I've got you, do you have some time to do some scouting with me? Of course, yes. All I mean, right. you did share the you shared the document with me. I've pulled it up on my phone, so I'm going high tech this week. Oh, Instead boy. of printing it out, I'm going to be reading it from my phone. All right. Well, I will give you a moment to load that if you haven't already done so by saying, uh, "Oh, if you're Taylor, new, I'm a pro. It, it's already here. I'm a pro." Well, then I won't even say anything else. No, I still will. Uh, if you're new to TSS, uh, the Scouting Network is one of the things you can do uh, to help support the show. If you join at $5 or any level, uh, you will be assigned a young player to scout. Uh, and then, Daryl, I know we've we've added a new wrinkle to the Scouting Network. Is that fair to say? Yes. If you don't want to scout, because, you know, it is a bit of work to keep track of a young player. If you just want to um, be... Uh, spotting talent that should be added to the scouting network, you can sign up and become a talent spotter, which is where we'll create a big, uh, I've actually created it already, but a big Google Doc. Um, if you sign up and become a talent spotter, um, I'll add you to the Google Doc and then you can recommend players that other people can scout. It is worth noting, we uh, prefer that you don't do both because then that's too many jobs being taken by too many people. Gotcha. I, I'm okay with that. I'm also okay with uh, if and when we start increasing the amount of merchandise we have for sale. I want talent spotter with an exclamation point in giant block letters. <laughs> <laughs> and you could use that in any number of se- settings. It's up to I you. I guess so. I guess so. Uh, so we've got a, a few reports to get to. Uh, we'll start with Gray Hair Gaming scouting yeah. Indiana Vasilev, 17 year old American midfielder for Aston Villa. The good news, Indiana is alive in the West Midlands. That's always good news. Uh, he received a five-minute cameo in the senior team's preseason match against Kidderminster, a National Quinn League. Harriers. I knew you. I knew you'd get excited about that one. A National League North squad in the sixth level of the English Pyramid. Daryl, how do you know Kidderminster? Uh, they're just not far from where I live. It's a, sort of two two train stations away. Is Kidderminster from my hometown? But they're not rivals. No, not exactly because they're a little big. They're a lot smaller than Wolves but bigger than, say, my local team, Hells Are in Town. So they're, they're a nice in-between team that I can comfortably support, with, like knowing that they're not going to threaten Wolves and they're not, they're not going to come and crush Hells Are in either. Uh, yeah, somehow I doubt Kidderminster will be threatening Wolverhampton. Uh, <laughs> the bad news for Indiana is that he started for the Villa U18 squad against Arsenal. They lost 4-2 against, and this is not a typo, a 14-year-old goalkeeper named Remy Mitchell, uh, whom uh, Grey Hair Gaming says is maybe one for the scouting network. Yeah, well, I think we spotted some talent, right? Maybe yeah. Remy Mitchell goes goes in there as well. The, um, the other bad news is that the dog's name was Indiana. <laughs> that reference I got, that wasn't a Westworld reference, so next I'm good. Up, next up, Jake Lamar <laughs> is scouting Austin Trusty. Austin Trusty, the 20-year-old American centre-back for the Philadelphia Union. Jake says... Austin Trusty had quite the week. First, he led his team to a 3-0 midweek clean sheet against the Fire to secure a spot in the U.S. Open Cup final, uh, where they'll play Houston Dynamo. Second, he put in a solid defensive shift in the 3-2 win against the Revs, puts Union into playoff position, um, although he was to blame for a conceded goal when a shot deflected off his shoulder. Third, he turned 20. 
happy birthday, Austin Trusty. There we go. Oh, and fourth thing, uh, Daryl, just so you know, is that in the Latin alphabet, Jehovah begins with an I. <laughs> Going right I back to that. you. Uh, Paul Braff scouting Anthony. I hope everyone has seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Otherwise, they're going to be very confused by everything <laughs> that's happening. Uh, Paul Braff scouting Anthony Fontana, 18-year-old American attacking midfielder for the Philadelphia Union. Anthony has been a regular starter in central attacking midfield for the Bethlehem Steel and started in a similar spot in the MLS homegrown game where he got some good looks but was not able to convert his best chance, that shot being saved by the goalkeeper. Um, he chose his spot poorly. <laughs> okay. Ira Are we going to keep this going? All right. All right. Ira Jersey is scouting Ashley Sanchez, the 19-year-old American attacker for UCLA. Um, Ira says Ashley Sanchez was ineffective in the attack against Spain as the U.S. got knocked out of the U-20 Women's World Cup with a 2-2 draw. Um, Ashley was subbed out at half time, ending her World Cup with a single goal. Most of the U-20 players will now head back to their college teams, and UCLA's campaign begins on Friday night. Wow, that's a fast turnaround. Yeah, uh, Ira noted that he doubts that she will play in that one, since she will be a little bit tired. Uh, That U-20 performance, obviously not that great. It probably does not belong in a museum. (laughs) Josh Buford is scouting Lewis Longstaff, the 17-year-old winger for Liverpool. Josh said, uh, the best-named footballer in England, Lewis Longstaff, has impressed this preseason, capping it off with a superb goal against Blackpool. The youngster will be hoping to impress new U18s manager, Barry Lutas, in hopes of getting minutes with both the U18s and U23s this season. Um, If he doesn't get minutes, it's because he has no ticket. (laughs) I'm not sure how I'm going to work a Swedish accent and asking about tapestries into the next one. Julie Nishimura <laughs> Jensen scouting Alan Halilovic, the 22-year-old midfielder for AC Milan. Halilovic saw his first minutes with AC Milan in the ICC series, coming on as a second-half sub in their 1-0 loss to Spurs and their 1-0 win over Barcelona, his former club. You're, you're all out of indie references. I mean, I, I could go with like... Uh, that win over Barcelona wasn't quite as harrowing, uh, harrowing as, say, a boat race on the canals, but few things ever are. <laughs> Andrew Eggleton is scouting Ollie McBurney, the 22-year-old Scottish striker for Swansea City. Um, Ollie McBurney ended up with four Scotland caps over the summer. More recently, despite interest from his boyhood club Rangers, McBurney stayed with Swansea because of new coach Graham Potter's philosophy, vision for the club, and overall style of play. Oli was given the number nine jersey and scored on the opening day with a win um, away to Sheffield United last week. He also had a pen saved today, but Jay Fulton still netted a winner, so it all worked out. Uh, we've got Matt Koss scouting Lucas Toussart, the 21-year-old French midfielder for Lyon. Lucas started his Ligue 1 season the right way with a 2-0 victory over Amiens. Uh, however, the endless energy Toussart, as described by Le Parisien after the match, uh, made a post-match comment about a lack of full effort and periods of stagnancy from his teammates. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I guess paraphrasing, you could say, you won today, kid, but that doesn't mean you have to like it. I was trying to remember. I was trying to remember what that guy said. <laughs> guy Yedwab is scouting Serge Gnabry, the 22-year-old German wide forward for Bayern Munich. Preseason is over, says Guy. Uh, so the German Super Cup gave us an opportunity to see where Gnabry will line up for Munich this season. And the answer is on the injury list. He picked up a thigh injury in the final training session before the Super Cup and his return date is unknown. That's not good news for Serge Gnabry. Um, oh, speaking of, did we did we update the DeAndre Yedlin injury situation? We did not. We should probably do that now. Yeah, so we had sort of, uh, unwisely, I think I'd yeah. repeated some reporting of him being out for five to six months. Well, we trusted Sky. Uh, that was our big the, mistake. Yeah, I think you called me on it at the time, so well done. <laughs> Uh, the official news from Newcastle is that it's not so bad and he'll be back in training pretty soon, right? Yeah. So things are not so bad for DeAndre Yedlin. No, although he did have to drink a cup filled with water and then suddenly he was magically better. Uh, <laughs> he chose jo- wisely. <laughs> Jonathan Holmgren scouting Foster Langsdorf, 22-year-old American forward for Portland. Foster Langsdorf was runner-up for USL Player of the Month for July 2018. Langsdorf is sixth in scoring in USL with 10 goals in his rookie season. It's worth noting that nine of those goals came from inside the box and seven were with his right foot. 
All right, so he's consistent. Yep. Um, Dylan Viac is scouting Kai Havertz, the 19-year-old German attacking midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Dylan says Kai Havertz was linked with lots of clubs this summer, but remains a Leverkusen player, at least for now. He was recently awarded the Fritz Walter Medal, which is given to Germany's best U19 player. On a side note, he and Julian Brandt continue to be best friends off the field and avid Fortnite players. So they're avid Fortnite players. I guess, <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, any anyone U19, I just assume, is a, an avid Fortnite player at this point. Have you played Fortnite yet? No, no idea. So I've had uh, multiple friends, including my buddy James, v- like really push me to start playing. And I do feel sort of out of touch with the youth of today because I'm not playing Fortnite. It might be a thing I have to get into. Just accept that you're old. How about that? Never. Never. And again, <laughs> as I've said many times to you on this program, my gerontology in-laws will not love that comment from you, my friend. Except that you're um, mature. How about that? There we go. There you, we go. You don't have time. You don't have time for Fortnite. You're busy with all these podcasts. I'm busy uh, counting to ten in Greek. <laughs> Colin Johnson scouting Jan Fiat Arp, 18 year old German striker for Hamburg. Just, uh, by the way, I haven't seen that movie in like 10 years. Just throwing that out no, there. Same, same, uh, same. Despite numerous rumors, Jan Fiat Arp signed a new deal to remain at Hamburg SV until 2020. Unfortunately, he hasn't been getting any time for the senior team as Pierre Michel Lasoga has been the preferred forward since his return from Leeds. Arp has instead been playing with Hamburg 2, scoring a brace in this week's match against VFL Oldenburg. It sounds like signing that new contract was a leap of faith. There we go. Good Jonathan Keep it alive. Penny is scouting Kaita Balde. Jonathan Maciel Penny is scouting Kaita Balde, the 23-year-old Spanish-born Senegalese attacker on loan at Inter from Monaco. Um, Jonathan says Inter have signed Kaita Balde from Monaco on loan for 6 million euros with an option to buy for a further 42 million euros plus a percentage of any future transfer. He managed eight goals and 11 assists in League uh, 1 last season and has 39 career goals, which isn't too shabby for a 23-year-old. Jonathan is now wondering if Kaita Balde still counts as a prospect. Daryl is wondering, is Jonathan hinting that maybe he wants to scout someone else? That is possible. Uh, so, Jonathan, <laughs> you can let us know maybe with an email to contact yes. at totalsoccershow.com. I am still surprised that Monaco were willing to let him go this season on loan. It makes me wonder if somebody had to, let, to say to them, let him go. Let him go, Monaco. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> on that brilliant note, you. if you would like to join the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, it is totalsoccershow.com slash join. Thank you to everybody um, whose reports we read today. <laughs> Thank, and apologies to everyone who we just annoyed with about 15 straight Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade references. <laughs> I like to think everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I like if people didn't that. enjoy it, maybe they, hope, maybe they hope the ground would open up and they fall in. There we go. I also like to think that the franchise ended with that film. <laughs> I've never, I've never rewatched um, Crystal Skull. I've got a feeling it might not be as bad as people think. Incorrect. Incorrect. All uh-huh. right. Uh, remember that time it begins with like a dancing gopher, a la Caddyshack, because that's what I remember. Even though it's not dancing, it's still pretty much the same thing in my mind. <laughs> or Groundhog, I guess it is. Whatever. Either way, or well, it doesn't matter. Either way, it's stupid, and you can't survive a nuclear blast by jumping into a refrigerator. I mean, he did. Either way, the uh, the URL is totalsockshow.com slash join. Um, please support the show by joining the Scouting Network. <laughs> I always enjoy – I'm not done with it. I always enjoy Patton Oswalt's uh, joke that, like, you could see how much Harrison Ford didn't like that movie. By the way, at the end, he has to deliver through gritted teeth, knowledge, the treasure was knowledge, in just the most <laughs> furious monotone delivery possible. I, since we're doing this, I genuinely do like the moment where, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, uh, Shirley LaBeouf mm-hmm. at the end. I guess this is a slight spoiler alert for the oh, end of Crystal Skull, but Mutt, come on. Because his uh, name Mutt. is Mutt. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, when the hat blows and he nearly picks it up and you think, oh, no, they're going to pass this franchise on to Shirley LaBeouf. Mm-hmm. And then Harrison Ford like scoops the hat away from him and is like, nope. That I think that, that was a good moment. That was a good, like... Uh, upending your expectations and not disappointing you in a way that they thought you that you thought they were going to type moment i'm happy that you enjoyed that (laughs) uh but i'm also very happy that you you were able to join me for the end of this episode uh i know you are in michigan under not the most uh joyous of circumstances uh to put it lightly um but but i appreciate you taking the time Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it was good to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we will have you back ne- uh, next week, right? We'll do some Skype chats. We'll do some Premier League review. We'll talk about some other things. We'll do some listener questions, all that good stuff, and maybe reference at least a few other movies. Yeah, I might rewatch The Last Crusade just to get a bit uh, get a bit more detail. 
It's probably a good idea. I think so. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks to you, my friend. We will talk soon.